I am Sandy Rumagu, and I am an artist. And I was born in uh, 1940 in Yakima, Washington. And my father was a territory manager for John Deere Company. And so <laughs> I was raised always near the earth through my parents. Um, by that I mean he was always out on these farms helping farmers get their equipment started. And so as a little kid, I would ride along with my mother out there. So then when I was about uh, eight, my father decided to take on farming as a way to earn a living. And he moved us all to the Willamette Valley out near Camp Adair. I went to a country school at Mountain View uh, to the eighth grade and then, uh, of course, transferred in and was a bus kid uh, all through the ninth grade to uh, being a senior. And then my mother's dream for me was to attend Willamette University after I graduated. And I tried it for a semester and it just wasn't a right fit for me, and so I transferred to Oregon State. When I uh, was working in administration at Oregon Coast Community College, I was also teaching a drawing class and a painting class, and then a design class. I am what is called a figurative painter, and that means really cut to the basic is just that I don't paint abstract. There's always a time lapse for me and I know for many of my colleagues is that when you experience something that's really quite profound to you and your own philosophy and what you think about it and then to paint it you have to kind of let that settle for a while until you get an idea of how you're going to present that so that it's not trite, that it's not demeaning, that, it, it, that you use the art language in its purest form through your own uh, use of the language of art. How good are you at the basic principles? I think you and I were talking about composition. Can, what can I do through composition to get the idea across and, and the subject matter across? And how am I going to, at what from what point of view am I going to take that subject matter? And one of my first um, big uh, series that I did was on the Ku Klux Klan. And that was when I inadvertently, I didn't realize how open they were and how active the Klan was in the South and how it was accepted. Uh, and one of the big newspapers, I. In, that was published in Little Rock. I don't know whether they're still in business now, but there was a, <laughs> a picture of the new Grand Wizard and who he was, his background, and he'd been elected. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there, it's just out there. And I was so shocked uh, about that. And so I had to think about that. And then the other thing was that I inadvertently attended a Klan picnic. I was on my way from Fayetteville to uh, Missouri. I was going to St. Louis. And you go back the back ways uh, so that you don't hit those freeways. And I was up near uh, the corner of Bentonville, which is the home of Walmart. Anyway, I, there was a I went to the rest area in the county park, and I thought there was a, a you know, a, a picnic, and then I also thought it was a craft fair because things were for sale. So I thought, well, I'll just meander over there and look and see what they've got as so I went back. And as the closer I got, the evil stairs were the first thing that I kind of noticed. But the next thing was that I looked on the rack, and there were little clan outfits for children. And I just, I thought, oh my goodness, dear me. <laughs> so I got out of there as fast as I could. But those sorts of experiences and then my, how I interpreted that, how it went against my own philosophy, what I thought about it, uh, the passion that I felt 
because if I didn't feel that truly, then I would do just, the work would become trite. And you really have to watch that very, very fine line when you take on subjects like that to paint. You don't want people to come in and say, oh, that's nice, oh, yeah. You don't want it in the middle. You either want it just terrible or you want it really good. <laughs> and so I try to stay away from the real terrible and work towards the really good. What would dictate the subject matter for me was what hit me in my philosophy of life the most. Um, one was, is clear cutting. I did an entire series about clear cutting. Um, I also, and then I would research it. I go out and I always work on location and I talked to people and, and it, so it, it's more than just going out, setting up and painting and looking at it, which is one way of doing it in a very valid way that many people use. It's called plein air or outdoors painting. But that never did really appeal to me because I wanted that other part in, in my work, that ex, uh, expressive way I, that I thought about would translate in the brush itself or the language of art. So, uh, and then I just finished a series on uh, tires in the landscape. I then became a board member of Oregon Coast Community College and we were looking for land and where to, to build the new campus, which is not new anymore. I think it's 20 years since they've had the campus. And I, uh, as we were out wading through duff and land around here, we would trip over tires. And I thought, my gosh, you know, this is just unreal. It's pristine, beautiful area, and then there are tires that, you're, that you can literally trip over. So then I started paying more attention to that and noticing more and uh, did, did those series. And it's interesting that from that series, I, I think I have three or four that are now in the permanent collections. Oh, the Portland Art Museum, uh, Oregon State has one in their building for public policy, which I thought was a, kind of a neat fit for one of those paintings. The real ultimate goal that you want as an artist in success, it's like you like to sell, but you really want them to go to, to collections because you know they'll be taken care of and uh, others can see. And, and it means that it validates, at least for some people, uh, your same view that you have, or they they get get it, or appreciate it, or like it, or you know all of those things. Like with any of the arts, you know poetry, you know certain poets, certain writers, photographers, you know you, it's the same, and the same also for a painter. What I'm painting now is I'm back to the landscape. And looking again at things, I mean, you can, the landscape is constantly a source of inspiration for me. But looking at tide flats, you know, they're smelly, uh, they're not very pretty at first glance. And yet there's something, I mean, that's just where life is. I mean, at the smallest level all the way up, it's where it all is, and the mud and the goo. And, and I, especially when you drive along the Bay Road around on the Aquina River uh, between Newport and Toledo. I have been looking at that for a long time. High tides, low tides, and the kind of just quiet and the loneliness and I don't know it just feels like you're you've hit like rock bottom and you're there the essence and that is the passion that I'm feeling which is a quieter passion than my outrage you know that would fire a lot of my subject matter so I am going to be doing what I'll what I'm always doing, um, I will always paint to my last breath. I can imagine not doing that. Um, it will 
be the same thing. I will just find different markets, which I'm starting to investigate. And as I get older and you accumulate enough work and people see you're still around, you get sort of a second look from, from people and that's happening. And so that's nice. Uh, very, well, just very comforting to know. So it, it's just more of the same. It's just keep on keeping on and using whatever experience I have. I can't believe November 11th, I'll be 82 years old. I wonder who in the heck that person is. But I have the same uh, insight, energy, and passion. And that will always be there. I can't imagine it not.